I'm Danny Bradbury and this is your World of Reg. Uh, today we're going to talk to Jim Revis, who's Executive Director of the Cloud Security Alliance, to discuss all things cloud and all things security and where they overlap. So Jim, welcome to the show and thanks very much for your time today. Well, thank you very much, Danny. That's brilliant. And so could you could you talk to us about uh, about the, the, the biggest, uh, most worrying trend in cloud security today? Is there anything that keeps you awake at night when it comes to, to securing those, those big uh, fluffy things up there? Well, I, I think that uh, if you look at where we're going in a very broad sense, I think uh, a lot of the concern has to do with how are we going to take something that's really a global utility, something where we're trying to service citizens, businesses in all countries around the world, and we're going to make that work within existing legislative frameworks uh, from different countries, different cultures, things like that. Like, for example, recently there was the... Uh, the, the big piece of news that uh, so, someone had said that, in fact, the U.S. Patriot Act is something they would need to abide by if there were demands for information. And that's raised the hackles of a lot of people, certainly outside of the United States and being uh, concerned about, uh, is it safe to put my information out there and are inappropriate people going to have access to it? So that's something that I think it's it, we're, we're going to have to solve this on a policy level, probably there's some new technologies we're going to have to employ that can allow organizations to safely encrypt their information in this shared cloud. But I think that that's one of those things that you think of as a hindrance to something that is supposed to be a, a global utility. Right. You know, and I remember uh, when Eric Schmidt uh, was CEO of Google, he kind of intimated the same thing, that if the authorities came along and asked for, asked for it, he'd be perfectly willing to hand over information. So so how do we do this? There's a policy level and a technology level. How are they going to interact? Well, I, I think that uh, on the on the policy side, and, and I don't know how how quickly we can expect different countries around the world to harmonize around a consistent policy framework, but we're, we're going to need to do a little bit better job. I certainly think that in the EU that the, the data privacy directive and the, and the work that uh, uh, countries in Europe have done for a long time are, are good frameworks that can probably be adopted on a more widespread basis. I, I think that that's something that we can we can potentially look to. I think that that's something that's probably going to take a while to uh, be able to accomplish. I think that uh, probably I, I have more faith actually in technology to help help us solve some of these problems. You you think of things like there's new trends like uh, format preserving encryption. And you, people often say, well, just, just encrypt information, but really the way we traditionally think about uh, encryption, it's really useful for when the data is at rest and, and data needs to be used all the time. But things like format preserving encryption or tokenization, that actually allows you to hold the keys inside of who the customer, the enterprise that's using the cloud, and they encrypt the information so that even the cloud provider cannot read it while it's being actually used, which is it's pretty amazing, and it's 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 is a leap in our use of things like encryption. But I think that that's that's where we need to go from a technical basis is having more sophisticated uses of key management encryption, sort of next generation types of things, having identity management. Uh, a, a more comprehensive implementation of that, and then then I think if you look in the in the the longer term from how the, that type of technology might impact policy and things like that, think about maritime law and how airspace and how we govern some of those things, and think about a large data center that maybe is in uh, London, and what if you could have like a virtual France or a virtual United States inside of that data center. And with it, you actually have the, the governance of those different countries and those laws. I think through a combination of, of technology and us sort of understanding uh, how we could apply different countries' laws and norms to that technology, you might see some things like that to evolve in, in the future. But for now, it's it's really a challenge, and you see some cloud providers, they try to put data centers in a lot of different countries and say, hey, the information never leaves your country. But when you think about that, well, there's there are some 
um, real limitations there because from a governance perspective, a court order might say, yeah, you have to go pull that information from any of your data centers no matter where they're located. So so there are some, some challenges to work through, but I have hope that technology will probably take the leadership role in solving that. Does it become a, a, a less tractable problem when you start looking at inter-provider operability, interoperability? So if, if you want to hand off something from one cloud provider to another, you're going to need to standardize whatever you're doing across an industry rather than just sort of doing it across your own your own multinational uh, sort of behind the firewall base of, of servers. I, I actually think that that is going to help solve this problem. Maybe not so much directly solving the problem, but by making it so simple to move information around what you think of like things like cloud brokering that are standardized ways that you should be able to have your business applications seek out maybe the low cost provider, one that's got lower energy costs or whatever else. And I, I think that that cloud brokering sort of thing will will make it because it's so easy that you you really would have a harder time tracking exactly where the location of the information is at any given time. But if you employ a higher level security controls, that would probably consider to be good enough. So so I think that sort of thing is going to help. And I, I think that's also going to help drive down the costs and make cloud more affordable and, and probably more resilient as well. Talking about resilience, of course, we've seen a couple of things kind of breaking uh, in in the cloud world lately. You know, Amazon and Google have both had their problems, and I'm kind of interested in in how. Well, first of all, is it is it possible for stuff not to break at scale? I mean, if those guys can't uh, can't can't make it work all the time, then then you know, what hope is there for the rest of us? And and secondly, um, what do we do in terms of SLAs and, and sort of holding um, uh, cloud providers, especially public cloud providers, uh, accountable for uh, for how they're performing? Great, great question. And, and I think to answer the, the first part of the question, that there, there is absolutely no way, technology is complicated, difficult, there's no way to expect these large cloud providers not to have glitches, not to have downtime with their systems. And I've talked to a lot of people who were AWS and still are AWS customers about some of their experiences and lessons learned. And what I found is that organizations that actually had built in some resiliency into their architecture were actually okay in a lot of these issues and and some of them got through without a glitch but when you're spinning up a a virtual machine inside of AWS for example you have to have this mentality that that's that's like a single hard drive and that's the, the level of fault tolerance you have in it, which is basically nothing. And there's capabilities within Amazon where you pay for high availability, or there's third-party brokerage solutions where maybe you actually have systems at another cloud provider, and it's providing that intermediary role there. And so people who had resilient architectures came through that okay, and that's the big lesson for the, the technical people is is you know that a provider is going to have the same issues that an internal IT department is going to have. There is going to be downtime. I think over time, we expect the cloud providers to do even a better and better job as they get more mature in how they manage these environments. But you have to build in, if it is something that's important and you need a high assurance, you need to build in a high assurance architecture. So I think that's where we need to go. I think from a... Uh, a transparency and a service level uh, um, availability and, and a lot of the, the things that we want to implement here. One thing that I, I really like that I point out, and it's really, it's it's fairly basic, is you can go to a lot of the cloud providers and you can see that they have status URLs that tell you what is happening there. And in, in some cases, it's it's more limited. Some providers have more information about you know, every application, every different data center. I would like for us as an industry to actually be viewing those status pages and providing more feedback to them on here's additional information that you should be providing on those. But I think that's a good start. If you if you think about an internal IT department, how many of them publish their IT status uh, publicly so that their business partners can be aware of that. You know, nobody does that. So I think that's something we can build on. The service level agreements regarding availability, that is something that I think is just going to follow more of this this public pressure. I, I see big companies, obviously, have a 
a, a lot more leverage in being able to negotiate something that is custom for their organization. But uh, you know what? What I found for maybe if you're a medium sized organization, the the it's it's uh, um, easier to actually implement going back to the architecture something that's more high availability and doing it yourself versus getting something special if they, if they got millions and millions of customers and and you're not spending a million dollars on them uh, it's it's going to be a challenge to be able to negotiate custom SLAs but that's where we hope the big guys will put enough pressure on it that the rest of us will benefit from that and so now c- could you talk about the uh the 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 way that the the private and the public clouds are going to interact over time you know we hear we hear these ideas of, of sort of hybrid private public clouds that could be used to you know protect critical information that you don't want going into the public cloud or could be used to to provide sort of failover services so if one part of the the sort of virtual infrastructure um goes offline uh, you know the other one can pick up and but but i get the impression that a lot said about this in theory, but but actually, hybrid uh, private public clouds are probably a lot more difficult in practice. Yeah, I, I think that we're hindered a little bit by some of the standards that are out there. And you, you look at we're we're in sort of these early days, and public cloud providers are certainly looking at we want to get a lot of market share, we want to attract customers. We want to provide unique and you might call proprietary features. And if you are an application developer, you take advantage of those proprietary features, then it becomes a real challenge to duplicate that in a private cloud environment. Now, there's there's some good work that's been done around some of the standards, and there's the uh, open virtualization format that help us do some of this so that you can define a workload. If we're talking about on the virtual machine level, have that running in a private cloud, being able to take that workload and moving it over to a, a public cloud. There are, there are ways to do that sort of bursting. Where I think we need to do a little bit more work is in the identity management part of that so that we can be able to securely federate. So if you've got a user directory inside of your organization, you need to not have to duplicate that out at the public cloud provider you need to use something like SAML2 to be able to um, ab- actually instantiate and connect to business services that are out in a public cloud. And and you, you want to do it that way. You don't want to just create like a VPN because then you're going to end up uh, basically creating a bigger pipe and, and uh, potentially allowing other sorts of activity on that pipe that maybe you don't want. Because we have to recognize that out in the, the public clouds, these very large environments, there's going to be everybody out there, just like the Internet itself. There's going to be good people, going to be bad people. We know that the the Sony um, incident, we know that they used cloud computing. Some of the, the malicious actors use cloud computing. So you have to consider those public clouds to be untrusted environments. Maybe your own private cloud for that matter, too, because we know how how um, smart those, those bad guys are. But we have to use things like more sophisticated identity management to actually do federation. And I, I think SAML2 and, and OAuth, those are some of the technologies we need to look at to do that. Well, final question for you, Jim, I guess, is, is just maybe from a consumer or a small business perspective. You know, I, I see cloud services that ask people um, to put, you know, the most sensitive information, scan every document you have and stick it up in this in this cloud-based service. We'll do text recognition on it. We'll store your accounting information for you. Um, and um, after, there, are, there are particular services. I think if anyone ever broke those services, it, all hell would break loose because there would be so much sensitive <laughs> information available. Um, is, is, I mean, how do, how do people cope with this? Because it, it just sort of seems to be something that, that people are doing and, and entrusting their information to willy-nilly and, and, and on little more than a brand name, really, and just uh, a whole bunch of convenience. You know, this is something that I struggle with is I have – I have friends, well, have friends who they run small businesses, and you look at what they're doing, and and even in these these tough um, environments, they they're trying to stretch, you know, every every dollar, every pound that they have, and wh- what uh, I actually come back to is that in the in the long run, or just in the aggregate, it's really better for them. It is more secure for them to take the chance of using the public cloud providers because they have absolutely no budget, no bandwidth to manage information themselves. There's certainly outliers. You know, I have some some friends who have a, a small business, and and because it interests them from a techie perspective, 
they actually do backups and and they actually have a pretty well organized system. But I find those people to be the outliers. And I think for a small business, you look, you you actually do have some professionals that are backing up your systems. You you do rarely lose information in public clouds, but you know, over the course of yeah, I've been doing IT for about twenty five years. And I've had so many friends and small business colleagues who have lost years worth of information, lost all their family photographs for forever because of a failed hard drive. And, you know, that really tells me that this this utility called cloud computing is something that is going to provide a lot more availability and capabilities for for the small business. And today, it probably has crossed the point where it's it's more reliable, more secure than what you can do yourself. Really, really good advice and, and, and some great uh, perspectives there. Thanks again for, for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Danny.